Welcome. I'm Ron Stupp, architect and amateur historian. This is the third presentation, Constantine and the Basilica, in a series of 13 presentations I prepared explaining the development of the 2,000-year history of Western Christian architecture. It is my personal belief, after Constantine and his mother, Helena's selection of the Roman Basilica as the Christian church prototype, there evolved two unique types of Christian church forms beginning to develop between the Eastern and Western Roman empires. Specifically, in the Eastern Roman Empire, where persecution over time seemed to be wider spread, of greater length, and possibly even more vicious than that of the West. The idea of adapting the local tradition of domed tombs to the basic Roman basilica form as a way of marking the location of a Christian martyr's death and or burial place was becoming common practice. The Christian was honored with a dome of heaven central to the church building. The dome of heaven was constructed either over the site of the saint's execution or his or her burial place. One could possibly think of these domes as a martyr's dome, or in other words, a martyrdom. On the other hand, the Western Roman Church was developed in post-Constantine Rome, mostly outside Hadrian's Wall. The original Basilica of St. Peter's is the most noted example. These churches developed into the Latin cross plan with elongated side aisles and a transept crossing the nave to accommodate the Western liturgical service. Later, the Latin cross plan played a major part in accommodating the massive influx of Christian pilgrims paying homage to the sacred relics displayed in chapels, usually along the uh, church's exterior walls. The Constantinian basilicas became the prototype Western church form for the next 1,700 years. Let's take a look at an example of the origin of our familiar church form. It's called Constantine and the Basilica, the Heart and Soul of Christian Liturgy. There will be another presentation about the arch, and it is the basis of all of the church buildings that came after uh, the basilica form that Constantine brought to us. So it's two really important presentations. If you get the basilica and if you get a little bit about the structural principles of the arch, then everything will fall in place from here on out at, at why these buildings look the way they look. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start. First of all, we're going to talk about Constantine and the Roman Basilica. This is a cross-section of a basilica before it was used for a church, and that'll be the first part of this and how Constantine came to power and selected this. So this is a, one of the timelines you've seen before on the Roman Empire, and we're going to look at kind of the middle of the timeline, starting with the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and ending a little bit past the Edict of Milan, where persecution of, of all religions was ended, supposedly in 313. It went on to about 325, actually, and we'll talk about that. That also has a form determinant in the form of the church, the way it in, they ended up, the church ended up developing. Okay, so if you remember last week, we had the Tetrarchy and the three bad guys framed in red, they were real active in the great persecution, which began under the emperor Diocletian. He was like the four-star general. Maximian on the left was kind of a three-star general. And then Galerius was working for directly for Diocletian and Constantius. Constantine's father was working under Maximian. But Constantius wasn't so much a bad guy. I mean, all these guys were tough military men. They had been in battle. They're, they're hard hard-baked guys. They're not pushovers. They're, that's how you, I guess, rise to emperor. Probably have to be pretty ruthless. But Constantius really wasn't as interested in, in persecution of Christians as the other three. And yet the other three really actively uh, went after them. Maximian had a son called Maxentius, and Constantius had a son called Constantine. 
And the two of them fought a battle, at the battle that most people in the West had never heard of. It's probably one of the most important battles called the Battle of Milvian Bridge. It happened in Rome at 312 AD. Before that battle, Constantine had a vision assuring him of victory in the name of the Christian God. What's interesting here is his mother was a devout Christian. His father was not. And I suspect all through his life, she had a great deal to do with his favoring Christianity. So anyway, saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heaven above the sun bearing the inscription, conquer by this. At this sight, he himself was struck with amazement and his whole army also. And this was written about five years after the battle. It's probably a fairly accurate statement about what was going on. And so this is the battle. The fact that you see Constantine's army crossing the river and is not on a bridge, you have to kind of take that as artistic license, I think. There was a bridge called the Milvian Bridge. Anyway, so Constantine comes charging across the river to attack Maxentius. And there's something interesting here. If you look at the shields of those guys on horseback crossing the river, what they did the night before after Constantine's vision is they painted it's something called the labyrinth on their shield. And what it is, it's not PX, it's Cairo, the first two Greek letters in Christ. And you can see a detail of that on their shields on the bottom lower left. So that's where Cairo came from. And it's continued throughout history, starting with this sarcophagus, which is in the Vatican Museum from the fourth century, and also in the 21st century at the Cathedral of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, and you'll see in both places the Cairo symbol used. Not only that, we even have a local presence on Palm Sunday, Father Taylor puts on the vestment with Cairo, and we also have one of our stained glass windows with that symbol. So that's one of the early symbols of Christianity. I think it even predates the cross. So Constantine won and took over the western part of the empire. You can see where that Constantine is in control of this part. And then Licinius took over from Diocletian over on the eastern part. So his battle of Milvian Bridge cemented him as the emperor of the western part of the Roman Empire. And then Licinius came, came up through Diocletian on the eastern side. And they both were the emperors of Rome, of the Roman Empire, and they signed the Edict of Milan, which proclaimed by the Roman em emperors, Constantine and Licinius, they bestowed tolerance for Christianity and other religions. So this was not where Christianity became the religion of Rome. Parenthetically, the Emperor Theodosius made Christianity the official region of <laughs> region, the official religion of Rome in 380. But these two were going to bump heads. So what happened was Licinius, you know, now the Edict of Milan says nobody's going to be persecuted. But Licinius decided that he wanted, to, he didn't trust the Christians. So he purged his army of the Christians. And there was about 40 of them. And that was called the Martyrs of Sebast. I hope I say that correctly. And these are two. One is a painting, uh, the other is a carved ivory of that martyrdom. It took place in Armenia, what's now Armenia, Turkey, in 320 after the Edict of Milan. And what Licinius did was he took the Christians in his army and stripped them naked, made them stand on a frozen pond in a very, very cold night. The ones that survived to the morning, so many died, any of the survivors, they were burned to death. It wasn't an easy life even after the Edict of Milan, but the point I want to make is martyrdom played an important part of the physical form of the Eastern Christian churches, and you'll see that by the use of the dome, and that was really common in that Eastern side of the empire versus the Western side. Constantine and Licinius's armies meet. Constantine 
massacres uh, Licinius in the Battle of Adrianopoli or A Adrianople in July 3rd of 324. Later that year in September, at the Battle of Chrysopolis, he finishes off the army and Constantine becomes the sole Roman emperor for both the East and the West. So Christianity goes from a humble origin to a grand public institution with an organizational hierarchy worthy of the support and legacy of a Roman emperor. So if you remember the house church that we looked at last week, this is about 4,000 square feet. It's a nice house, but it's not suitable for a religion sponsored by the Roman emperor and his mother Helena, who was, uh, as I said before, a Christian. So they had, you know, what kind of a structure would be suitable for a Christian church that was supported by the emperor? You know, you just can't have a little a tent or a, or a house church. You have to have something grand. But the problem with these options that were available is that the Roman temple was really not acceptable as a Christian church. You can see that in Maison Carré, which we will look at later in, in neoclassical presentation, you know, it has an enclosed room. This one happens to be about 50 feet by 35 and a front porch, and that's it. You have a small gathering. There's no light in there, so it all have to be lit. You'd have to be sitting there with smoky torches or candles. They just didn't work out. Plus, they had a link to the pagan past. They weren't suitable for large worship gatherings in the interior, and public rituals particularly sacrifices and worship were performed in front of temples, not in the interior. The Christianity was now looking for group worship, community worship inside. And probably most importantly was risky politics. In other words, converting existing temples into Christian churches would alienate the powerful Roman ruling and business classes. So what to do? So uh, a secular building, the Basilica, was selected by Constantine as a suitable prototype for the Christian church. In this case, I selected Trajan's form. I, I don't think we know which specific basilica, if there was one, that was the prototype, but I have information on Ulpia, which was built in 1112 AD, and it will certainly illustrate the point going forward. This is a, the basilica itself was part of the forum. The long side opened up directly on the forum. Obviously, this basilica was modified to suit the liturgy of the Christian worship a little bit later. This is a computer drawing of what that facade might look like going facing Trajan's forum. Another couple other drawings. This is a model with the basilica shown here facing the, the form and a plan showing the stoa colonnade around the form, the basilica, and behind here were some buildings and another temple was back here. Has nothing to do with the basilica, so it's just this kind of orange area is what we want to be looking at. So we took that and I put it over here to blow it up. And it happens from altar to altar. It's 385 feet and it's 182 feet wide. So now we have a grand scale building and it's about 70,000 square feet on the floor. And it gets modified over the years, but let's talk about really how big this building is. You can play football in here if you could work around the columns on the sides outside the hash marks and getting into the end zone would be a little bit more of a challenge, but a football field will fit inside of this. That's a large building. And there's the house church to give you a relative size. That's 4,000 square feet. So it's a, it's a, it's not as modest little hut. It's a pretty nice house, but it's not you know, it, it's not as grand as what Helena and Constantine are looking for. And so this is what a basilica looked like in cross section. This is what it looked like in plan. And I'm going to try to go through this because some things remain all the way through to today. Basilical forms that are chosen as churches. 
This is where it all began. And we have, obviously, we don't have symmetrical ends to the church. So you can wipe that out and wipe out the library and Trajan's column. But on one end, we have an altar. We have a bema, which is a raised platform at St. Mark's. Of course, it's just one step, but it's there. And we have an apse. Our apse happens to be a fairly shallow rectangle. The apses for years and years were half a cylinder turned on in and topped with a half dome. We'll see that in a little more detail. Then the assembly hall, which later became known as the nave, and you can see the assembly hall here, which goes all the way up to the roof. It's a huge space. And the apse, which is beyond these columns, is back here. Okay, so then we have the assembly hall, the apse, the side aisles. This happens to be called the five aisle basilica. There is the two side aisles, the assembly hall, and two more side aisles make, making five. And then we have the triforium. It's a gallery. You look down over into the lower level. This became a convenient device to allow women and slaves to be separated from men during Christian worship, unfortunately. Not all churches carry the triforium. And then we have the clear story. And whenever you have a building that's as wide as this, you need to get light into that interior. It's just dark, really dark. And so what they did was they built this wall that's supported by this row of columns and this row of columns. And they pushed it up over the roof of the side aisles in the triforium and they put windows in it so light would come through these windows and light the interior. And then a wood truss roof, and I both face an underlying wood because wood is flammable, and that became a major issue later on. That's why we're going to get into stone construction. Okay, so the modified version of this particular layout became a five-aisle basilica, as I said before. This is a 3D and a longitudinal cross-section and an elevation from the outside, a 3D cutaway. And you see the apse here and here and here. And then the exedra is a half dome cutaway here. See the outside of the exedra here, which is over the apse. And you'll notice that there's some pretty thick material here and here. And that is overcome the forces of this half dome. And we'll get into that in a little bit because it becomes a major form determinant, Romanesque and Gothic buildings. We have side aisles, which are right here on the outside, did away with side aisles on accessible from the outside. In the cross section, it becomes the assembly hall here. So the side aisles are beyond the assembly hall here. You see the side aisles here, assembly hall here going all the way up to the roof. The triforium, it's here, it's that walkway around. And then the clear story at the top to let light in. And then the wood truss roof. So that's basically, that hasn't changed. If you look at the great cathedrals, you're going to see these basic same three vertical elements modified. They're there. And actually, there's a wood truss roof. It's covered by vaulting. Uh, you would never know that there was a wood truss roof in Notre Dame in Paris until it burned. But that wasn't the way it was supposed to work, the fireproofing anyway. Okay, so a major crossroads of the Christian church form and political expediency must re be resolved. And that's where religion and politics meet. Back in the late third century, Marcus Aurelius built wall around the city of Rome. You can see the wall here. It's in it's this thin black line with little bumps on it. It's called the Aurelian Walls. Parts of it are still there. You can see it if you go to Rome. And so Constantine was faced, well, where do I put buildings in here? I don't want to, you know, uh, people had private property. There were sacred areas. That was something else that he and Helena were faced with. What He didn't want to alienate the pagan majority of the Romans and the power structure. So what did he do? And I found this really wonderful paper online by Charles O'Dall that really helped me understand what was going on. So I took his paper and I added orange to show the outline of the Aurelian walls, the Tiber River is flowing in this way. 
You can see here, so the wall jumps the river in, in two places. And the inside was called the pagan core and the areas outside were called outside the walls. So we have two types of basilica. One is a liturgical basilica, which becomes more famous or more utilized in the West. One is called St. John's in the Lateran. That site was Maxentius's. I think that was his stables and some fields. I don't know if they were used for drill or whatever. And that's where he chose to build his first basilica church. Another one called the Holy Cross in Jerusalem. And then he built the rest of them outside the wall. Most notable, of course, is St. Peter's right here. This is called Vatican Hill before the Vatican was there. And I'll show you the reason why it's located where it is. So here's the pagan core. There's two inside the wall. And then the rest, St. Paul's is outside the wall. And they're called St. Paul outside the wall, St. Sebastian outside the wall, and so forth. This is where his daughter, Constantina, ended up being buried. There's a church. This one was, we'll take a look at it in a minute. It was built for her, Basilica of Constantiniana. It later became St. John's in the Lateran, which about 600, which is what it's known today. But you can see it has that basilica form. There's two side aisles, a nave. So the assembly hall is, is now a nave. There's a narthex. And you can see here clear story windows, and you can see a bit of a curved apse back here. Here it is in plan, and the light faded out plan is what it looks like today. The photographs on the bottom, what it looks like today, and it's basically the inside has been completely remodeled, 18th century Baroque, Rococo kind of interior. So don't look at that in terms of its accuracy of what it looked like in the 300s. The giveaway is there's an oval up here, which we don't see until the Baroque period. But it does have all the major components, as a nave, an altar, a wood truss roof, clear story lighting, and the triforium has been blanked out and just used, as, uh, in this case, for bas relief. The altar's back there and the apse behind the altar. You can see here, this is photograph here is uh, this one closer up. The exedra is behind it. That's the half dome. The apse is a, is a cylinder turn, half a cylinder turned on its end. And what's interesting is we think that this sacristy, it was probably a sacristy. It was stuck on the side to hold the equipment for service. We're not quite sure. And then to balance things out, another shed was built on the other side. And so we, what we have now is a basilica form slightly modified by these two sacristy pieces, if you would. And you'll notice that they don't go across as a, as a transept would. In other words, these are like sheds stuck on the side of the building right now. So it's still that five aisle basilica with a couple of sheds stuck on it. And we also have, I want to bring to your attention, a, what's called a glorification arch. I understand that some of you don't know what that is. We have one at St. Mark's. And if you're not, if you haven't seen it, take a look and, and see if you can find it. This is what old St. Peter's looked like. And it became the church prototype for 1,200 years. Here's the basilica form. It's now the transept has been elevated to the uh, height of the nave clear story windows in the transept. This is probably a baptistry or this is. And there was fourth court kind of a Garden of Eden place to transition from the secular world to gradually go in and then go through the narthex and then into the basilica itself. I notice they have a bell tower here. This is very much an Italian thing is, is the bell tower is separate from the, uh, the basilica itself unlike uh, France and England, where they're engaged or become twin towers in the front. So what we have here is three plans superimposed on one another. And the reason I want to do this is it explains what's happening with St. Peter's. Before St. Peter's, during old St. Peter's, and then new St. Peter's. It starts out with the Circus of Nero, the plan of Nero. So this, there was a road. And then the circus went 
was here. And I, I think it's kind of a Ben Hur thing where they use it as a racetrack is the plan of old St. Peter's in the dark black line. You can see the five aisles. And then this dotted line is the outline plan of new St. Peter's. All these two were approached from Rome. This was the old part of Rome to this end, pagan part, and the church was open facing that. Back to the plan of the Circus of Nero. We have the witness obelisk, which was right here. Why is it called the witness obelisk? It may have very well been the last thing that St. Peter saw as he was martyred. This right now, you can see it right here in the circus, that's the witness obelisk. And this now sits in the center of the Baroque Plaza in front of New St. Peter's. And what happens is after he was martyred, he was buried. Then they built the old St. Peter's over him and he was buried right underneath the altar. So. This kind of set the location for, for St. Peter's. They wanted to face this approach from Rome, and they wanted to put the altar right over St. Peter's tomb. Okay. So if you just look at St. Peter's, it's the five-aisle basilica, the altar, the apse, the, uh, the baptistry, or, or maybe the sacristy and it's fully developed now. We have the wood truss roof, which later becomes a problem. And we look at old St. Peter's, here turn 90 degrees, here's the plan of the old basilica and the plan of the new basilica. And here is a section through St. Peter's tomb, we have, which is right here, and we have the necropolis and the grottos. I didn't know about this when I visited St. Peter's years ago. Uh, I'd be interested to go back and visit that. But right below here is, so when they put new St. Peter's, they put a pin in the altar and said, it's going to be right over this tomb. And this is the baldachin, which sits like this, a very large object inside St. Peter's, we'll see that later. So this became a, it was a liturgical, but it's also a martyrial basilica. And so what I like to summarize this section with is this stuff around it, if you look on the bottom, just goes away, not used by the Christians. And then we have the nave. If you look over here, you'll see the colors change. The nave, it was the assembly hall, but it's very large, you know, very high space. The side aisles, the altar, which is beyond these columns, the columns go away, these columns go away. There's the altar, there's the bema, that half circle right there. And then the apse beyond it. That becomes a chevet, eventually a circulation route for pilgrims. That becomes a very important form giver later in the church. And then we have the triforiums that are above the side aisles. You can see them in blue here. They don't show up on the plan. They're above the plan cut. And then the clear story, the two red lines, those are allow the wind, the walls pushed up. And so light can come in and light the broad interior. And then the wood truss roof, which is subject to fire, and they did burn. And this is kind of what, what it looked like during its heyday. And it became the prototype for 1,200 years. And the reason it was torn down is it was falling apart. One of the interior walls was out of plumb by seven feet, meaning that the wall was leaning one way the top was seven feet out from the base, and they figured it's time to tear this down. And we'll get to the new St. Peter's in the Renaissance. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please join me in viewing the fourth presentation, the physics and the metaphysics of the stone arch. The next presentation will begin a comprehensive look at stone construction and how stone's unique structural properties gave distinctive form to the post-Constantine Western churches. Kindly leave any questions or comments you may have below. Thank you.